Good morning and welcome to Faith Lutheran Church. The 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Today's sermon is from the book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 to 13, titled Dumbing Down the Law with Pastor Ken Cody. Our text is from the gospel just read, and we'll just read verse 8, where Mark writes, By inspiration of God, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. This is our text. Dear friends, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Today's gospel tells us about some of the conflicts that Jesus endured on his way to the cross, on his way to be executed. And we often hear about the criticisms that the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law level against Jesus and his disciples. And today's gospel points out one of those traditions, one of those criticisms, and that is eating without ceremonial washing of the hands. And notice in the text that the problem isn't that the disciples did not wash their hands. The issue is that they did not wash their hands according to the tradition of the elders, which was an additional, a special kind of ceremonial washing. And let us also keep in mind that not all the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were evil, power-hungry people. Not at all. They were good and believing scribes and Pharisees. And not all the scribes and Pharisees were enemies of Jesus. There were some very, and perhaps the majority, were good. The problem is that the hypocrites among them had political control of the group. They set the agenda for the group, and it was they, the hypocrites, among this religious group that set out to discredit Jesus and eventually to kill him. And I think another misconception of the scribes and the Pharisees is that they were ultra-conservative conservative doctrinal purists. After all, many of them knew the Torah, memorized it word for word. The Torah was the first five books of the Old Testament. Now imagine memorizing word for word Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. These Pharisees knew the law of Moses, and they knew it very well. So I think it's easy for us to conclude that the Pharisees were these old reactionary fossils, while Jesus was this modern, progressive innovator who could really think beyond the box. Now, the truth is quite the contrary. Not that Jesus could not think beyond the box. After all, he created the box, but he's going to live and teach according to his creation. But if you examine the gospel carefully, you'll see that it, that it is Jesus who quotes from the Old Testament. And it is Jesus who calls for faithfulness to God, the God of the Old Testament. And the word that Jesus used for an ultra-conservative doctrinal purist, the word was disciple not Pharisee. On the other hand, the standard that the scribes and the Pharisees appealed to was the tradition of the elders. Now this may sound like a wonderful thing, an honorable standard, but the tradition of the elders was not honorable. It was an addition to the law of Moses, an addition that God did not, in fact, command. The tradition of the elders changed the law by diluting the law. And it actually enabled 
the Pharisees to appear righteous and godly as people who kept the law, and at the same time, the tradition of the elders allowed a loophole for evading the law. They appeared righteous, they appeared to the people as keeping the law, but the tradition of the elders, in addition to the scriptures, actually allowed them to evade the law. And Jesus uses one of their own examples from the tradition of the elders to show that point. And he talks about one law, about washing hands. He says, you know, you Pharisees teach the people that if they would set aside a certain amount of money for the temple for future use, that money, which would have been given to their parents to take care of them, no longer has to be given to the parents because it's, it's going to be given to the temple. And in this way, they violate the fourth commandment. Honor your father and mother. In this way, they appear righteous outwardly because they're given their money to the temple. And the Pharisees wouldn't even allow them to use that money then to take care of their parents. They appeared righteous, but they really weren't. And I think this is an example of a common trick that we all use from time to time to fool ourselves into thinking that we too are keeping the law when in fact we aren't. We dumb down the law. We figure out a way to make the law doable. Let's take an example from our epistle lesson. Now the Apostle Paul tells the Ephesians, the right relationship, the godly relationship between husband and wife. He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, so much so that you would even sacrifice your life for her. And then Paul then says to wives, respect your husbands. Now the Bible has a lot to say about the right and godly relationship between husbands and wives. But what do we do? We turn to Amazon.com. We open up our PC and we see titles like Marriage by the Book, Seven Vital Relationship Insights, Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, Five Love Languages, and many other titles and books that you can glean from the internet. Now, do these books have some useful information? Many of them do. But when we think that following the advice of these books makes it possible for us to actually keep the commandment of God, according to the Apostle Paul, we're fooling ourselves. We're following in the footsteps of the Pharisees. We're teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And we humans dumb down the law like this a lot. I can remember a very young couple, husband and wife, very fine people. And this lady, young lady, came to me and she said that we know that the Bible says that we should give our time and talents and finances to the church. But if, if a person would donate a lot of his time and donate a lot of his talent, does he really have to then give an equal amount of his money to the church? You see how we like to dumb down the law? No, the Lord wants us to give of our time, our talents, and our finances. In fact, Jesus says, you'll know where a person stands because his heart is where his treasures are. Another 
I thought this was kind of humorous, but another lady came. She said, you know, I, we know that gambling is wrong. But, you know, we go to the casino from time to time, and, you know, we set aside 10 to $20 for entertainment. So now gambling becomes entertainment. I said, well, if it's entertainment, why would you limit it to $20? I mean, you go to a movie, you go out for lunch or dinner afterwards, and that's going to cost you more than $20. So I really don't understand why you would limit entertainment to $20 here, but not elsewhere. We like to dumb down the law. And we convince ourselves that we are keeping the law while softening the law. Grinding off the edges just a little bit, making it a little bit easier for us to follow. Then we can actually keep it. Then we feel good about ourselves. Of course, that's a lie. God doesn't grade us on the curve. And God will not give us a pass because we tried our best. Instead, Jesus says in Matthew 5.20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot enter heaven. And in Matthew 5.48, Jesus says, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so now we have the standard by which we are judged if we hope to get to heaven. The standard, if we want to use the law, is to be perfect. Never have sinned in the past. Do not sin now. Cannot sin in the future. And so our perfection must be equal to God if we wish to save ourselves on the basis of the law. And that verse alone, Matthew 5, 48, should make it clear that we can never save ourselves by the law. You know, we might ask, if the law condemns us so thoroughly, and it does, why does God give us the law in the first place? Is God some kind of a sadist that he actually loves to see us suffer? Of course not. So why does he give us the law? To make us feel bad? No. God gives us the law. He uses the misery that the law causes us because we must reflect upon our own life. He gives us the law to open up the gospel of forgiveness for us. You see, the law, by showing us how sinful we really are, shows us our need for a Savior. The law knocks down our resistance to the good news of Jesus Christ. Have you ever asked yourself, what is easier to do? To repent of a sin or to receive forgiveness for that sin? And since both are an act of faith, I believe they're equally difficult. Because if I sin and do not want to repent of that sin, I don't want to hear someone telling me to repent. And on the other hand, if I don't want to forgive someone, I don't want to be told to forgive. I mean, you hear people today on television who have just lost a loved one by a tragic event say things, I think, out of emotion. I pray they don't mean that in their heart. They say, I can never forgive this person. Well, if that person doesn't repent, what is there to forgive? He dies in his sin but you should not have hang anger in your heart for anyone because it does no good for you. 
In fact, it hurts you and is dangerous. The law obliterates any thought on our part that we can somehow cooperate with God in order to save ourselves. The law puts us to death in order that we might be brought to life, to the life of the gospel. The gospel that brings life is simply this, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to thousands of people after his resurrection. And those who believe that Christ's suffering and death on the cross forgives them of their sins, all of their sins, and that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead opens up the way to eternal life, those people have the new life and a clear conscience. And they are at peace. Because they look at the cross and they see Christ and what he has suffered for them. They know they are forgiven and that they are destined for eternal life. But this this natural inclination that we have to earn our own forgiveness, to earn our way into heaven is so strong. Because if it wasn't, after hearing a word of forgiveness in Christ, we still do not feel worthy. I can tell you many times, talking to people who have strong faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I would say to them, Your faith brings upon you God's love, his grace, and you are righteous and perfect, and you're going to heaven. And oftentimes people will say, I hope so. No, it's a promise. It's more than a hope. I suppose it's a way that we can show some sort of humility when it's really not. Because God declares, and God What he declares, he makes. He declares those who believe in him righteous. He declares and makes them righteous in his eyes. And so when he says you are forgiven, you are forgiven. The only way to receive perfect salvation is through the Holy Spirit's gift of faith. It is then that God the Holy Spirit will use the gospel to show you that your salvation is in no one other than Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ alone who gives you peace and eternal life. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us please rise and together confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thanks for viewing today's sermon. Faith Lutheran Church is located at 3000 Cannon Road, 8 Southeast, St. Cloud, Minnesota. 
Phone 320-252-3315.